Well, it's getting to the end of the year, and what that means is people are starting to focus on, I had a great season, I want to keep it going, I had a bad season, and I want to make some changes. And part of those changes, especially in the off-season right now during the wintertime, revolve around, you know, among other things, scouting and habitat plantings, planning your food plots for next year, planning, 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 is actually getting in the woods and creating deer bedding areas and working on deer bedding areas. And most people, a lot of times, are going into the woods with an expectation that they make this certain deer bed, they're going to have a lot of deer bedding there and it's gonna change their property forever when really, you still have to focus on access. You still have to have a quality food source, uh, pr food plots on private land. You can't just make a bedding area and solve all your problems, even if you do it right. And we're gonna talk about some ways to do it wrong and what are some of the fails they typically see. And we'll start off with number one. Um, this is something I've been battling for years. And we can even say just talking about hinge cuts in general, that I recommend hinge cuts on about 20% of all parcels. that are not a fit on every parcel, just like, Beans are not a fit on very many parcels. Corn, I, I plant corn. It's not a fit on every parcel. In fact, I can't plant it in Wisconsin. It just wouldn't be a fit. Switchgrass, I love switchgrass. Doesn't mean it's a fit on every parcel. Timber cutting, timber harvest, not a fit on every parcel. Water holes. There's so many things that are great habitat improvements and, and tools in the, in the bucket of deer habitat management, including hinge cuts but that doesn't mean they always need to be used. And you'll see certain people using them all the time, no matter what they do. They're always using them. They're trying to fit that square peg in a round hole and it just doesn't work. And it creates a major failure. But number one, when it comes to hinge cuts, those high hinge cuts. What's the purpose of a hinge cut? The purpose of a hinge cut is to provide cover and food. If that hinge cut starts at waist level, deer can actually feed on the browse that shooting up the side of the hinge cut, that's a purpose, you want that to stay alive. I've seen them stay alive for over 20 years or more, I'm sure decades at this point. But then also you want that cover to be side cover. Deer are not hiding from planes, birds, and the sky. They don't need cover going up, they need cover side to side that separates deer from deer, it separates deer from hunters. And frankly, that's what creates rabbit cover, other critter cover too. So it all goes hand in hand, but they need to have that escape cover, that escape cover Measure it from three feet, three and a half feet on down, not five, six feet head level on up. When people create those head high hinge cuts, the browse is starting head high. It's starting well above their head, so high above their head they can't even reach it. I've seen hinge cuts that start seven feet in the air. Pretty cool that someone was able to do that, dangerous probably, because that chain was right at face level or at head level. I mean, God forbid a, a chain breaks and uh, hits someone, wraps it around their neck. The bottom line, that browse is starting head level and so is the cover. I've been in hinge cut areas where you can look under the hinge cuts for 100 yards. They cave in, they fall. You can't predict that. Keeping them at waist level, you have to keep them at waist level. The only exception is if you're blocking off hill country on a side, maybe the side of a road. I've seen someone literally get in the bucket of their tractor, not advisable, but actually create hinge cuts that were 10 feet high because the swamp dropped down and that created a level so when you drive along the road, you can't see into that lower land. So there are exceptions always to the rule, but head high hinge cuts for bedding areas, travel corridors, uh, really bad. And while we're at it, species. I was at a property last year in Indiana. I hope Dylan, i probably showing that uh, footage right now, but it's it was red cedars that were hinge cut, used to manipulate deer travel person paid $10,000 for four days of cutting by a professional deer habitat manager cutter. And after five years, the deer are still avoiding the area. Didn't regenerate, didn't break down, it's red cedar, too narrow of passes, deer don't walk through it, they don't walk through that area in most areas, but someone that worked on a, on a property somewhere, and then that was taken, and it's kind of like fitting that square peg in a round hole where it's a hinge cut we'll just do it everywhere we have to hinge cut everywhere so water holes are great we'll put them in everywhere switch grass is great let's put switch grass everywhere even screening cover i love john comp from north of dwight hill he has the best screening cover probably in the country it's no food it's thick and it stands up to northern winters it's a hd screening blend from north of dwight tails great great product but you don't need to plant that everywhere it's appropriate in certain circumstances 
And when it comes to hinge cutting, it's appropriate in 20% of all lands and certainly not species that aren't breaking down, species that aren't growing, species that aren't regenerating, because again, you want that cover regenerating at our waste level so they can actually feed on that regeneration and have cover. I've literally had customers go in or clients go into hinge cuts and cut them a half. You're basically hinge cutting hinge cuts to get those hinge cuts down so the deer actually have browse and cover so they're not looking under them, especially when all the leaves come down. Number two, road plantings. Road plantings of pine, road plantings of shrubs. Again, I repeat this often, but in the mid 90s when I ordered trees right in the back of the order form from Tuscola County, but it was Tuscola County, um, it said grouse populations in Minnesota were increased 20 times by staggering rows. Straight rows increase predation, warfare, and disease among animals. It's high stress. Deer don't want to sit and look down a row 50 to 100 yards. Coyotes can go by. They can see the deer sitting there. Deer see other deer. Deer see people easier. They see long distance. That's why deer don't like to bed near a straight road. They'll do so on a curvy road. They like to be closer. They don't like straight lines. Where you want deer not to be, you plant straight lines. So straight road plantings on the edge of your border where you might be accessing of your land is perfect. Straight road plantings where you want deer to be, not so perfect. Doesn't matter if it's conifers, shrubs, what the species is, very, very bad. If you have those road plantings, a really good remedy to that, just like hinge cuts, if you have high hinge cuts, go in there and hinge cut your hinge cuts so you drop them down. Make sure the deer and passageways are not determined by an overhanging hinge cut that could fall at any time and block off the whole movement. And if road conifers are on your property, I've seen 40 acres or more at a time. You can go in there and remove pockets, cut them down, remove them, allow for non-conifer hardwood species to grow in. That allows the, bro the breakup of the rows. You can drop occasional conifers in there to break up those rows. If you have shrubs, you can remove shrubs. You can plant more. You break up those rows and it'll be effective. I've even had clients uh, where they have lots of shooting lanes on a property and they're in a swamp. They have five or six blinds, all these shooting lanes intersect. They go out for 150 yards. Deer avoid the entire area, mature bucks do, because they don't want to cross straight lines. Usually shooting lanes, someone has three shooting lanes that extend out from a blind. Buck travels here. Extend the line, the shooting lanes, buck travels here. I've seen them extend them three times. Buck travels here, consistent all the time that happens because mature bucks especially don't like straight lines. They don't want to cross them. They run across a lot of times. So why would you put straight lines back in your bedding area? Number three, mixed grass bedding in a bag. If it's mixed, it falls down. Even mixed switchgrass species in one bag, the tall species shades out the short varieties. Doesn't matter if it's switchgrass and switchgrass. If it's shaded out and it's competed out, then it's going to die. It doesn't matter what species is actually shading it out, it will die. That's why you can't mix switchgrass and HD screening or Egyptian wheat. Because if it's light enough to allow the switchgrass to grow in the, in the screening blend, the annual screening blend, then it's not thick enough to actually be a screen. And if it's heavy enough for the screening blend, the, the Egyptian wheat, the H2 screen, screening blend from Northwoods Whitetails, like John Comp, then if it's thick enough to be a screen, it's going to shade out the switchgrass and the switchgrass will die. So if that happens, you have big blue stem, little blue stem in a mix that's taller than switchgrass, it's going to shade out the switchgrass. And that's why a lot of mixes only have a pound, pound and a half of switchgrass mixed with other grasses. After three or four years, the switchgrass is gone because the other species shaded it out and killed it. But bottom line, all of this, we have a few hundred acres just off to the side of us right here, about a half mile away. It's all pheasants forever type mixes, pheasant mixes, mixes of various types of grasses, pollinators, what all lays down in the wintertime. So there's no cover. So all the thousands of pheasants that have been put there all die. They have no cover. So when there's no cover in November, December, January, February, March, the species die doesn't promote sustainable cover. So if you can't even hold rabbits and pheasants in an area like that, you're certainly not going to hold deer in an area like that. Don't even have enough cover for rabbits and pheasants. So think about that. When you have that mix, bedding in a bag, if you have good solid switchgrass, you want the single strongest variety in that mix 
for your area. Cave and Rock is most of the areas up here. Shawnee out to the Dakotas. There's a cool Canadian variety of switchgrass that John Comp's getting through North, Northwoods Whitetail soon. I hear that's better. It's stronger, holds up to more snow, so it'll be it'll great to see how that works. There's varieties that are more Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana. So there's various varieties. Cave and Rock happens to be the area that's in this. We talk about it a lot. It's probably the most common because it covers a lot of states and a lot of, a very large region that it can be planted. But it, you, whatever you do, it has to hold up all winter long, fall and winter. That's why you plant solid pockets of switchgrass, conifers, shrubs. And then you plant pollinator blends, early successional growth briars alongside. If you just allow the field to go to early successional growth, you could be waiting 20, 25 years. We still have a, uh, a portion of the property in Wisconsin. The valleys there haven't been planted in ag since the 50s. They still have not regenerated because the soil is so poor and stripped off with all the erosion that took place back in the 50s, 40s, 30s. So the switchgrass we plant there is all that's there. That's all that's coming in. So you can't mix this together and expect good results. You have to plant separately. Food, forages, forbs, and flowers on this side. Switchgrass over here, surround it with switchgrass. Make sure it's hidden. And whether it's early successional growth, whether you're planting shrubs, woody shrub tips, hardwood regeneration, red maple seeds, box elder seeds, that's how you create a bedding area. But it can't come in just one bag alone. Most girdling and hack and squirt falls squarely on the shoulders of the lower value timber within a stand, aspen, ash, soft maple, in favor of oak, hardwoods, cherry, hard maple. And unfortunately, you're releasing species that don't help wildlife and you're killing the species that help wildlife. In those situations, better to remove the high dollar timber, get a timber sale, and then manage that good growing, highly prolific aspen, ash, soft maple, so the box elder, so you have good regeneration in there. That's what's gonna give you your cover and your browse and hold deer and wildlife, not those hardwood species. So a lot of times, hack and squirt, I've seen girdling, girdling of aspen trees alongside a food plot to give it more sunlight. Well then, those fall down over the next two or three years. I had one almost hit my client Frank in Michigan when he was just out working on the food plot, it almost fell right on his head, a 14 inch diameter, probably 40, 50 foot tall aspen came right down right next to him. Felt the ground shake, hit hard. I had to go in there and cut them all down just to keep Frank safe. But they should have never been done in the first place. They're the most prolific wildlife species on the property and they're girdled and ruined. And that's an example, it happens a lot. Whether it's box elder, aspen, people are girdling, hacking and squirting the wrong species of tree. Typically people aren't hacking and squirting oaks and hardwoods, cherry. Instead they're doing it to the less desirables. And always remember that the lower the timber value, the better the wildlife value. Number five, starting with buck bedding. Everyone talks about buck bedding, creating buck beds. But if you have food here, you have screening here, you then have a doe bedding layer, you have mixed habitat improvement, cover improvement, TSI, whatever it is, meaning you're dropping large maples, soft maples to get sunlight to the ground, your heart, your uh, hinge cutting smaller maples or hardwoods. You're taking out pockets of aspen, but you're working to thicken the stand, and then you have buck bedding back here. You don't have buck bedding right here or here if you don't do this, the screening, the doe bedding, the improvement of the general, general timber stand that's in there for holding capacity. You can't start with buck bedding, just create a certain type of buck bed. That's the belief that people create a buck bed because you created this bed with these secrets, a buck's going to bed there. It's not the way it works, folks. It's always in combination. Food, screening, doe bedding, then buck bedding opportunity if there's enough cover and depth. So always focus in the right location first, do it in the right order, and then you'll be on your way to success with your deer bedding areas. And this is a great way to start. We Our season ends right here. I believe Sunday is a, yeah, Sunday, January 2nd. The season ends on the 3rd. My plan is to cut some timber on the third and fourth. I can't wait to get out in the woods, fire up the chainsaw, get the chainsaw ready. The first thing I'm doing after the season, working on deer bedding. I have some areas that I need to work on on our timber here in Minnesota. I can't wait to do so. Make sure you can avoid these fails. I want you to improve your deer habitat, have a great herd for next fall. And along with that herd, you have great habitat. And of course, if you have both those, you're going to have a great hunt. Folks, I wanna make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your 
food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes so that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.